Great. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. So welcome everyone to A Wild Night in with the Fungi Guy. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening and a huge thank you to our members who make these evenings possible. Um, we're really excited to have... <laughs> Hi, Neil and Seth. Hi, Neil and Seth from, from Ali. We're really excited to have Ali with us again uh, for a second round of Amazing Fungi Antics by phenomenal request from everyone who watched his talk with us last year. But don't worry if you didn't. Um, no prior knowledge is needed. Ali's got everything covered. Um, <laughs> so there'll be a chance for questions at the end. So if you have any questions as we're going along, feel free just to pop them in the chat and then I'll read them out and ask Ali at the end. Um, so yes, I'm gonna pop, pass you on to Ali, AKA the Fungi Guy, who is a fungi expert, enthusiast, and legend in the fungi community. He holds workshops and sell out walks across the country and is just incredibly passionate about fungi and I know that everyone is just going to have an amazing time listening to this talk so yeah here we go um, hi everybody um hey it's 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 a real it's genuine pleasure I really forget how much I enjoy these experiences so thanks for having me uh, I'm really flattered because I've heard there's quite a big number watching. And on a genuine note, I was just saying there to Rebecca, you know, th at the end of the day, you could catch this up on YouTube. So to join live, you found time. We're all busy, aren't we? You found time for that. I think there's a compliment in there. And for that, I thank you genuinely. Um, now, whether I'll honour that time, whether you wish you had gone to Pilates for an hour instead, I don't know. Because uh, for, for the record, I realised, I said, yeah, I'll do a second one. That's nice. And then I realised I've really... Usually I just get asked by different organizations and I deliver the same kind of thing in my own style, but ultimately the same foundation, a beginner's guide to fungi. Well, you've had that. And now I'm like, well, what, what's next? I have to up my game and what else do I know? So and I the answer is I don't know. I've had to find out quite quickly. What else do I know? What can I offer you? So I've got quite a few bits and pieces um, and I'll, I'll try not to repeat myself too much, but I've got some nice bits and bobs. Uh, and I'll take you through now. I'll, I'll share my screen. I can have a little look. Uh, uh, someone's asking already, is there a link to the first session, which I missed? If I'm right to say, you can go on YouTube on the Sheffield and Rotherham's uh, Wildlife Trust YouTube channel. If you type in the Fungi Guy, I guess those things will all link up and you'll find it. So you can watch it back there. Uh, okay. So um, let's share screen. And I'll tell you a little bit what's going down tonight. Oh, hang on a minute. Not yet. Not yet. I'm not ready to do that. Uh, let's go here. Sorry, it's that tech moment. It's been a little while. It's that tech moment. That one. Share. Okay, I have to move that to there. Slideshow from beginning. Okay. Any minute now, I'm sure it'll be fantastic. Yes, it's coming. Sure. All right. OK, everybody, welcome. Let me give you a little uh, rundown of what to expect to see tonight. All right. Who am I? Very quickly. I think you've had that already, haven't you? But I've done I've been on the outreach committee, the education and outreach uh, committee that is for more for the youth part of things. I enjoy trying to connect with children. I feel like a big kid. We all are, aren't we, really? Um, but I enjoy that. I work in a primary school, so it really keeps me young on the inside. But I'm very grey, very quickly from working with them on the outside. Uh, so, but yes, I've worked with the BMS uh, and helped make UK Fungus Day for many years. Uh, that's a real thing and it's coming up in a few weeks. Uh, the Northwest Fungus Group is my local recording fungus group. And they're a lovely bunch of people who've nurtured me and taught me so much over the, the 10 years I've been with those guys. Um, yes, I do stuff for various organisations. In fact... Uh, I'm in the, in the new Wildlife Watch magazine and actually genuinely haven't opened this yet but yes I'll be in the new one so thanks to this is how my journey began because I got Instagram because of the Wildlife Trust so I'm in this new new um, new magazine I've not opened that yet it's quite tempting and let's have a little look and yes I'm on um, uh, Instagram as well can I check for me right now I can't see my the, the last part of my screen because it's blocked by pe the view of people is it the same for you or do you get my whole screen? So I'm going to. It's OK. Oh, I've got an OK. Thank you for that. 
That's nice. All right, great. It's just me that can't see part of my screen. That's good to know. Thank you. Okay, then. I'll have a quick look in the chat in case there was a... a oh, brilliant. Thank you. Oh, you guys, it's such a community. It's really lovely. All right, let's move on then. Uh, I filled my screen with images and text and I can't see everything for all the little icons. All right, what are fungi? Very brief overview because we've looked at that already and what they do. Uh, spores for thought. Uh, that's a pun. A bad, it's actually a good pun, but it's somebody else's, so I've tried to change that. It's not fair, but I do like it. Uh, meet my mates. I will introduce a couple of fungi that I have with me tonight uh, to share with you um, how to identify fungus. So I thought we'd do a couple of little deep dives today. Not very deep, um, but some uh, to take us off on little tangents, because there are so many avenues of of pleasure. So many avenues of pleasure in fungi. Uh, so I've just opened up a couple that came to mind. And like, as soon as I open that door, I'm like, yeah, there's some good stuff going on here, isn't there? So spores is one. We're going to have a bit of a, a look around spores, a bit of a quick overview. Uh, and also on how to actually identify fungus. Um, I'm hoping that there's some people of all different um, skill levels here tonight, but especially if you're a beginner, I'd like to be able to help you to think about what's entailed, how to go about identifying a fungus, because it can be quite a daunting thing. Uh, being brave, that just means don't be scared to jump out of the car. I mean, not while it's moving. Please drive responsibly and park sensibly. But go into little grass side verges and whatnot, because the rewards can be great. Um, I still get embarrassed, but the point being, I found some super things and there's a couple of funny little anecdotes I'll try and share with you this evening. Um, Affordable instruments. I'm just going to keep that as a mystery. Uh, and a fungal ditty. I have my guitar. There were a few requests for whether I could sing a, a new fungal song that I've written. I didn't know if it was appropriate, but I've just discussed with the lovely ladies from the Trust. It's like, it's two minutes long. It'll be a world premiere on the internet. So maybe if this becomes this incredible global phenomenon in years to come, you can say you were there for that two minute sitting of a, of a song. Okay, so we may do that if there's some time at the end. And then I'll make sure there's time. Uh, at the very end of the talking for some Q&A. Um, and I think I've got a little bit to add to that there. Let me just have a look. I'm really hoping I have. Yeah, and also, disclaimer that, wafty science. I'm going to say it, right? A, a, a lot of what I talk about, my passion, my care about fungi, it's all anecdotal. I'm awful for remembering numbers and just really specific science. And I know that could really great, obviously many of you will be really great scientists and it's an integral part of the nature community understanding and recording at the science level. And I know that a lot of the Northwest Fungus Group are scientists, but I am not one. I think I've been trying to work this out and make peace with myself. I think I'm a communicator. My point being that when I've come to look up all these things that I thought would make my content, I can't find the original articles I've, I've met. So basically, it's my interpretation of these things. So forgive me, if it's just a little bit wacky, you might not know any different. That's what I'm kind of hoping for. Um, but uh, So I'm just going to go for it. Let's move on. Let's do it. Uh, we're going to start a little game. Last time, an icebreaker, I think they call it, don't they? Last time we did, can you uh, identify, can you beat the teacher? Can you identify what's a real thing and what's a fake one? There are some incredible odors in the fungal world, okay? And it's it's one of the real pleasures for me when I'm on a foray and sharing this experience of what can you smell? A little bit like a wine and you get these bouquets of raspberries and kiwi gusts and things. Um, these layers that people can't always get, it's the same in fungi. And the more you do it, you start to really become attuned. However, I've thrown some fake ones in. You've got to tell me with your thumbs up, thumbs down, if you think it's true or false. For this, I'm going to open up a screen so I can see lots of little screens. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And then I can see what your thumbs are doing. OK, first one then. Uh, the cupboard under the stairs. I want a thumbs down or a thumbs up or a thumbs down. That kind of chemically kind of bleachy smell, you know, soapy kind of thing going on, polish. We've got thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay, I mean, the answer is false. Sorry, that was more than I made up. But even as I said it, I realised there is a bleach cup. So actually, depending what waft you get, there is a bleach cup that smells of bleach. So do you know what? You're not completely wrong. Okay, next one. Watermelon. Look, I like the conferring. For me, I've got a view. It's a bit like goggle box. I can see people on couches laughing to each other. It's nice. Uh, mainly thumbs up. And, oh, you guys are informed. I can only see thumbs up. Correct. It's true. 
uh, a young, particularly young specimen of the dry and saddle. If you get your nose under that, also known as pheasant's back. Um, I can't see the picture, but I guess you can. Um, yeah, we'll smell of watermelon, which is ace, isn't it? Okay, engine oil. Oh, you! Oh, I thought you two, Hannah and Tom, were really tuned in, but actually, one went up, one went down. It's, it's uh, I like that. You're not going to be swayed by each other. The answer is true. Yes, <laughs> engine oil is the real thing. Um, uh, it's a wax cap. Is it the oily wax cap? I feel like it's got a better name than that. Um, yeah, and it's quite remarkable because it's this, yeah, this sickly kind of oiliness to it. Um, so one of the wax caps. Not a common find, but I love it when I get it. All right, next one. Beef monster munch. Just that savoury umami beefiness. Come on, Mary, give me a sign. Is it an up or a down? What do you think? Let's have a look. The answer is false. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> um, although that doesn't mean I haven't smelt it when I've smelt a mushroom. It has been known on a foray, but that's because someone had just had it for their lunch. They've just been eating beef monster munch. So always wash your hands. I'll just be aware of what you've been eating strong foods on a foray. Don't do it. OK, next one. Banana milkshake. <laughs> yeah, I've got thumbs up, thumbs down. And the answer is true. True. And there are people in the room uh, this evening in their rooms who were there on the foray when that happened. I passed a web cap around and I love this moment. You pass it around the, the, the semicircle of people. And I kid you not. And this is this is the thing about this. So um, uh, what's the word where it could be many? Oh, I usually have this word and I can't find it this evening. Subjective. So as it goes from one end to the other, it went from banana milkshake to meat and potato pie. And here's the funny thing. We all kind of agreed. There's this like Venn diagram in the middle where we're going, actually, yeah, I can get that. Uh, so it's very suggestive as well. But yeah, uh, that was a cotton areas we found, a webcap. Hot flip flops. Oh, you don't think that that kind of warm, hot, sweaty rubber thing? No. Oh, you're right. If you put false, you're right. It's not true. It's not true. OK, couple more left. Coconut sun cream. What do you think about that? Coconut sun cream. I think, I'll tell you what, I don't know what group I've got here, but I'm kidding. Nobody tonight. True. It's true. Well done. Yes. Amazing. The coconut milk cap is a beautiful smelling mushroom. And it's one of those that can convince someone, like a non believer who's like, nah, I just keep getting mushroom and everyone has a bit of a laugh. When you get that one going, that's like, oh, this is a real thing. Uh, the injured larvae of a goat moth. <laughs> ah, it's funny because you're not so sure this time. You're not so sure. And the answer is true. Uh, I forgot about this one. And I was doing a bit of research thinking, what are the most extreme ones that I've not necessarily met? And this was one of them. And when I did a quick Google, I can't remember now. I meant to write it down, but I think it's something to do with like fermented fruits. Um, so, uh, the, the actual goat moth larvae can smell. Of, so I bet there's a specialist out there. Is it le 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 up terrorist? I can never get that word out. Um, put it in the chat. If you're familiar with that smell, inform me. Okay. And last of all, the smell of a room that's been smoked in the night before. <laughs> uh, it's almost like, <laughs> could he make it up? Would he make it up? Would you fall for it? It's true. Well done. Well done, Diana, for one, Denise. Uh, yes. Um, and I haven't got a picture because the mushroom's so rare. I just remember reading this in the British Mycological Society, one of their uh, uh, like monthly newsletters about a guy that had found it. It's only been found twice in this country. And he crawled on his hands and knees to, to find this little thing. And that was the smell. That's what he put it down as. Only a microphile would say that, wouldn't they? So that's that's a little smells, some trues and falses. When you're out there, people smell your mushrooms. All right. OK, I won't spend too long on this, but it's worth just a quick mention of what are fungi. Fungi are a kingdom of their own. They are neither plant nor animal. If anything, humans are more closely related to them, um, to fungi. Uh, yeah, a kingdom of their own, not a plant. And they are essential. They are essential to life on Earth. We wouldn't be here without them. Um, there's a nice little phrase. It's this, no fungi, no forests, no forests, no future. And a lot of us as, as people of, of, of the land and nature lovers, which I imagine many of you are here today, uh, will understand the, the premise of that. Uh, but they they underpin so much. Uh, uh, there was a beautiful statement from a mycologist, I know, and he went, all that is green, you know, so they're responsible for nearly everything. 
this mycorrhizal relationship. It's a word you will have heard before, like a symbiotic symbiosis, a sharing of nutrients and water passing both ways. And it's fundamental grassroot tips, bushes, shrubs, trees, dependent, of course, therefore plants. And of course, that's a food source as well. So on so many levels, they're important. Um, in fact, I brought down a couple of facts. I was never going to remember these. So I do have a couple of notes. Uh, let's see. <laughs> do you know what I did? I lost my page to write that little note to my friends when I spotted them. Um, here it is. Oh, in fact, I've got a little thing to. I like being shown things to make me remember. There are six my so the fungus itself is underground all the time. I think most of us would know this. If you don't, here's the you're learning for this evening. When we find a fungus, whether it be a bracket on a tree or a mushroom in the ground, that's actually the fruiting body. The mycelium, the fungus itself, lives on underground. OK, and then a teaspoon of soil, I have to hold it against my shirt there, a teaspoon of soil like that. There are six miles of mycelium. So it's everywhere we tread. It's quite a remarkable thing. That's my wife's best teaspoon. I won't tell her about that. She won't be watching. She'd never know. She couldn't. She, uh, she supports me, but she's not interested. Um, let's have a look. Oh, there's so many facts. I'm not going to I'm not going to do a lot of numbers. Let's move on. Uh Three roles of fungi. Very quickly, you've got the friendship fungi. I'm going to use the language I use with the children. The three roles, the friends, the recycler, and the killer. Friendship fungi are these we spoke about, these mycorrhizal relationships that enable um, plant life and so many things that are green to survive. Up to 90% of all things green depend on fungal relationships. You've got, so that's the friend. You've got the recycler. These are nature's uh, soil magicians, agents of decay, I've heard them called. And anything that's living, that's organic, that now dies, needs to be decomposed. And they are decomposers. And if we didn't have them, we would have to swim to work every day up to our neck in leaves. Uh, so we have to be very grateful that they're, they're doing things. And what they do is they break down cellulose and lignin, two of the toughest substances on the planet, and break it down, allowing nutrients to get back into the soil and allow everything, that whole cycle of growth to begin again. Uh, saprotrophs, they're called saprobes. And last of all, you've got the parasites. They might parasite plants, plant pathogens. It might be trees that they kill off, or it might be, well, humans can die from them, I suppose, but that wouldn't be a parasite. That's just just, just ill judgment, isn't it? Uh, or they can parasite insects and bugs and the likes. Um, okay, of which that fungal song, if we if it's chosen to, we do that later, it's about a parasite. Okay, I changed the headline. I had written spores for thought, but that's my friend's catchphrase. So I thought, right, the spore, the merrier, which I actually think is dreadful. I'm sorry. I wasn't on the A game there. That's a dreadful pun. So let's have a little look at spores. Spores are essentially, and you can see them there, essentially the seeds of a mushroom or a fungus fruit body. And it's their re reproductive seed. In there, what they need to do, like all living things, need to, to be able to reproduce, they need to spread their seeds, okay, successfully, so they can germinate and, and so forth. Um, I'll just show you the groups of of fungi that are known differently because of the way they disperse their spores so first of all we've got the spore droppers basidiomycetes um and that's your typical mushroom and in fact that's actually what the stem the purpose of that stipe if we're using a little bit of, get a little bit of science language in there for you excuse me the stipe is designed to take that that spore loading surfaces which are underneath the cap um uh, they're actually uh, born within the gills, which are those flaps of tissue underneath the cap of a mushroom. Uh, the the stack's designed to push up and out and above that grass level. Excuse me. I had a fizzy drink. What a bad idea. That's very unprofessional. I won't do that again. Um, and then it can be push up, out and above that grass line and into where the air currents can be so that as those spores just drop out from those gills, and we're talking tens of thousands an hour, they can drop out and they will pour off into the breeze and then hopefully land on a substrate, an appropriate substrate, where they can begin to um, make new mushrooms, essentially. Simple science here tonight. Nothing too heavy. Because I don't know anything too heavy. All right, they're the spore droppers. That's your typical mushroom. Um, let's have a little look. See if I'm missing anything off the corner there. All right. Next one are the spore shooters. So these fungi disperse their spores slightly differently. These are the ascomycetes. And their spores are actually on these surfaces in these so some flask fungi like this and these cup fungi that you might be familiar with. Uh, this is the Scarlet Health Cup. They actually uh, shoot out their spores into the atmosphere. Um, 
a nice little trick and you can visually see this. You can often see it, not so often on a mushroom. I've rarely ever seen mushrooms sporulating. But actually just at the weekend, I was at a fungi festival and we found a big bracket to be able to share with the group. And it was a bit like Indiana Jones where he holds that staff and that light goes bing when he's trying to find the ark in that room, whatever that room is. And it just pinpointed right onto this beautiful bracket for us. And you can see these spores pouring out by the hundreds of thousands. And it's sporulating. You can see the clouds of spores pouring out. These are a little different. And you can also see their spores if the conditions are just right. If you get on your hands and knees, go up close and give it a long, nice puff, like a like a directed one, not a but a there's a pause. It doesn't blow the spores off. There's a pause because it's about air pressure. It isn't blowing the spores off the surface. It's about a change in air pressure. And then they'll do this beautiful little hiccup of spores. And it's a lovely little crowd pleaser. You know, you get a, a nice gentle ooh in, in the crowd if anyone's watching that. Or if you're on your own, you can do it in your head. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a lovely little moment. So spore shooters. Um, so that's the way they disperse their spores. And then we've also got these guys, the, the stomach fungi. Gastromycetes. This is actually not an official kind of um, term for the way that mushrooms hold their spores, but it's for, for the purposes because it's been known as well. It's like a fake little um, avenue of, of, of spore holding. Um, essentially, though, it's 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 encased, which is why I've mentioned them. You got your puffballs and things like bird's nest fungi and stink horns are all encased, so they're almost in like a stomach like where they will mature before that then breaks open. So it's just a different way that the spores are produced before they're then uh, passed on and um, um, to be able to carry it away and do their thing. So you've got the stomach fungi, the gastromycetes, and these are some lovely little common puffballs uh, coming to that. Um, so I'm going to share with you just a couple of really cool fungi and the way they disperse their spores. Uh, this first one, I actually got, you got live, a live experience last time. You may remember I had an Earth star. Um, and basically, it's a mechanized spurs dispersal. Uh, spur whoa, I got that wrong, didn't I? Spore dispersal, which means leaves, twigs, uh, creatures, foxes, mammals, uh, even high winds and raindrops as they hit that little sack there, as you can see in the middle of the center of that earth star, that is full of mature spores. And as it hits it, it'll poof out a little bit like that first image that I was showing you. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's pretty cool. It's a mechanized spore dispersal. It fires, it fires up, up based on... Oh, someone's, someone's on the, on the mic. mic. I'm getting feedback from myself. I think it's gone again. Okay. Um, and then we've got this one, firepower. This is pretty cool. This is uh, the hat thrower. And it is millimeters in height. And its uh, habitat of choice is uh, cow pats. Um, and the first time I ever found this, because I can see there's someone here, Sarah's here, Sarah Fox, just give a shout out. Um, I go wild swimming. And just to let you know, Sarah, we have to walk through a cow field to get to this little lake where we've got permission to swim. And the first time, only time I've ever chosen to look for this, I got on my hands and knees and I was looking for something else in the cow pack with my little eyepiece. And by accident, I spotted all these. I'm like, get in, it's the hat thrower. I think they're probably a very common fungus. I'm just not sure how many people are really on their hands and knees looking at cow pats with an eye lens. Um, and they have an incredible spore dispersal. So their spores are in that little black sack that uh, that hat you can see there. And in order to be eaten by cows, which they need to do, it's a necessity in their reproductive um, um, cycle, they'd actually have to pass through the intestines of a cow. Now, the cow isn't going to eat the dung, so they have to fire their spores out of, oh, there's a name for this circle. Oh, it's all oh, uh, um, of repugnance, the zone of repugnance, I think it's called. What a great name. And that's where the cows won't find themselves. So it fires fast enough and hard enough to fire their spores out of that, which is pretty cool. Um, and in fact, that that pressure that builds, it uses pressure to do it is one of the let's have a look. Here we go. It goes a pressure of 20,000 kilometers an hour in two microseconds, which is unbelievable. I've got an additional thing to that. It's like oh, uh, let's have a little look. Yeah, it's 21,000 times the acceleration of gravity. So it's pretty. It's a pretty intense. Uh, it's, I think it's one of the fastest accelerations um, in, in in nature. So that's quite incredible. So that's the, the hat thrower that you can find on cow pats. And last of all, 
I have to move my thing. Oh, this is cool. This is the bird's nest fungus. Took me years to find this. Um, and then a log came along at once, just like buses sometimes do. Um, and these beautiful little things, they're actually only the size of like a fingernail. So that maybe it's that we're walking past again and we don't see them. They're wood rotters, they're saprotrophs. But they're, they're, these are in the gastromycetes. These are your stomach fungi because all their little spores are inside these little eggs that look like bird's eggs within this little nest. And they, um, it's brilliant because this uses water, raindrops, to be able to water for dispersal. But actually just filling up with water isn't good enough for them because they just spew over the side and hey ho, it might work out. They actually, it's actually, someone worked out, I think the angle of the raindrop hitting inside that bird's nest will fire out the egg at just the right um, uh, angle. And behind it, it leaves a trailing like tail of stickiness, like a lasso. And that's on purpose so that it can catch on to nearby grasses or possible um, uh, substrates for then it's in the optimum place. So it's got its food source, just like all oh, everything living needs a food source to be able to work. It's optimum space. So it's got this incredible lasso where it can catch onto things. Uh, an amazing thing. In fact, I found a diagram online. Whoop, there it is of how it fires them out. There we go. And it can lasso onto. Um, I couldn't fi I find one of meals. So thanks to Forest Floor Narrative, I didn't ask the permission. I've tried wherever I can to use my own photos, sometimes some of the other people's. Really, really cool little thing to find. That, after all the years of never finding it, I found on a, a rotten fence post in the school garden. There you go. And it's been there two years running and not so far since. So there you go. All right. Um, spores are all around us. There are some dangers, and I'll mention them in a minute. Uh, but ultimately, we are breathing spores all of the time. Um, thousands and thousands. In fact, our pillows, it might have been saying here, with every breath, we're in, inhaling spores because they're in the air, they're in the atmosphere. Let's have a look. 99% of them will not land where they wish to. You know, they're just going to land on a substrate and that's it, which is why they make millions. They make millions. A toadstool, traditional toadstool mushroom will make millions of spores in its in its very short lifetime because they have a rubbish um, success rate. So they make that many just to, so that hopefully if it just gets the right spot, we'll be able to uh, reproduce and make more. Um, there's a nice fact for you. Up to five million just on our pillow of an evening. So they are, it, they are, they are in us, on us, and we are of fungi. Um, but there is a, a little danger that comes with that little warning um, that there is a condition known as lycoperdinosis. And basically, it's if you inhale, if you were to get a puffball and go whack, and it all shoots out, and you really inhaled that, you could be putting yourself in sort of severe danger. There, it's a nasty uh, respiratory issue that comes up as a as a as a result of that. There are a couple of cases with, I think like teenage kind of youthful type thinking they could do something it might get them in a particular mind state and instead it made them in a real mess and they were in the hospital hospitalized for a long time so don't go snorting puffballs right up your nose but accept instead that spores are generally all around us and you can sniff a mushroom no problem at all it's about that inhalation of millions all at once where it comes back out your nostrils that's not cool um I did just this little picture here. I got this, managed to get this little picture of how cool spores look under a microscope. Um, they are absolutely mi microscopic. You do need a microscope to be able to see them. And they can be a key reason, thing, identifying feature to know what a, mush a particular mushroom is. Many fungi are um, identifiable in the field with ma macro uh, features. You can tell what it is by this, 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 and this, brilliant. And I'll run you through some of those in a minute. But some some genus are just really hard. The caught in areas, the web caps are like the final frontier for lots of mycologists because there are so many who look so similar and then you've got to get it under the microscope. Uh, it's something I've not got to yet for many reasons, but I'm sure that when I do open that door, it's going to be, I have dabbled, but I just haven't quite got the patience for sitting still. Um, but yeah. Uh, and you get them all sorts of beautiful shapes. I've just read yesterday that um, fiber caps, quite a common mushroom, uh, some of their spores are the shape of gummy bears. So there's something for you. All right. Oh, there we are. I, I reminded myself there. Um, so you can make your own spore prints. How are we doing for time? Ooh, I'm going to have to get a, a, a move on, a wriggle on. Uh, you can make your own spore print. It's dead easy and it's a beautiful thing to do. If you have an abundance of, of a particular mushroom in a spot, okay, remembering we're only taking the fruiting body, the fungus lives on. But at the same time, remembering we want to tread carefully. We don't want to take things away because these are homes for invertebrates, for flies. Uh, it's food source. But if there's an abundance 
or even actually for ID purposes, which is, again, is a separate thing. The learning process, I think, is really valuable in our lives to be hands on and learn. You can take a, a mushroom and you can do a spore print. And so ideally what you do is you get the mushroom. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. On the way home tonight, the weather has obviously been baking hot and just started raining. So there are no mushroom fruit bodies anywhere for me to see at the moment. Um, so I've actually made one out of dough. So let's let's. Uh, I would normally hold up a real mushroom, but I made a dough mushroom just so because I really want to. I like to learn by seeing things actually happen. So if you've got the mushroom like that, you can slice off the cap of the mushroom. OK, slice off the cap and lay it down on. Now, you can choose. You could do it on white paper. You could do it on black paper, but ideally half and half because spore prints can be all sorts of colours. So you could do it for fun, aesthetically, like, wow, what a beautiful thing to do, especially if you've got children, share that experience. It's like, wow, look what's come out of this cap. Or you could do it because actually it could be the difference between understanding what one mushroom is or another. Once you've got the spore print colour, you're like, ah, now I know what you are because you're pink and not white or because you're brown. So you put down your cap onto white, black paper, but even better, a piece of glass. I've got here a Philadelphia cream cheese lid. Uh, other cream cheeses are available. Um, and I put it on there. And then what you do is just a, a little bit of water, a little bit of water, just moisten the cap. This is when you've got in after a day out, moisten the cap and put a little tub over the top and leave it on a shelf somewhere. Just leave it on a shelf in your house. The reason we put that on is because even just minute air currents in your home can carry those spores away and it might not sit beautifully straight down the spores. And usually overnight, depending how fresh that specimen is and how mature, it will dump its load onto that there and you can peel the cap off and you'll be left with one of those beautiful patterns like you saw there. And doing it on a clear plastic means you can scrape it and you get a really um, accurate understanding of what colour those spores are. So there we go. Um, there's my dull cap. Um, let's go back to a quick share screen. Gonna make that a little bit smaller. There we go. That's good. Okay. Yeah, you get some beautiful colours uh, and things like amanitas, always a white spore. Things like um, there's your pink gills that give off pink spores. I'm not going to name them all, am I? Because you won't necessarily remember. But yeah, it, 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 that's something that you can help. And even you can actually know what something is because if you've got a cluster of mushrooms and it's sat over the top of another, it will leave the spore print there ready for you. You can peel back and you'll see it's dumped all its spore load onto the mushroom cap below. So you can learn what that is in the field. All right. Let's have a little move on. All right. Oh, got to mention this because this is one of the gigants, uh, um, the giants of the spore world. Um, this is a giant puffball. I'm sure many of you would have seen images online. These things can get huge. I slightly held my hand slightly closer to the camera there for effect to make that look massive. But it was pretty big. I actually made a model of one um, to demonstrate to children at school. Let's see what I've written about this. <laughs> There's a bunch of facts. Okay. This fungus has more... Uh, spores, so more seeds effectively than any other living organism. Now, there'll be some people smile if you've seen my video because I tried to recall this to a video. I've done a video on it on YouTube and I'll be damned if I could remember all the. And I'm, you know what? I'm going to put it up to see if I can help myself. Let's see what it says. There we go. Seven trillion spores in just one fruiting body, you know, for something that would be about this size. Okay, this is my little model one. So, seven trillion. Now, then, here's the thing. Uh, if every spore was a second in time and you were to hold your breath, you would be holding your breath for 200,000 years. Isn't that something? It's a bit abstract, I know, but it's it's kind of a fun fact if you get it right. Uh, and yes, and when you find a giant pup ball, you can find out if it's mature or not by slicing through the middle. This was supposed to be a demonstration. Pure white. Pure white means that it's nice and fresh. And then the spore mass inside, which is what this turns into, starts to turn an olive green, a bit yellowish, and eventually a dark brown until the whole thing is like a great big piece of sponge, which then tumbles around, spreading its spores everywhere, helping itself to sporulate. If you see one, give it a boot. You'll be helping it. Okay. Oh, and a quick anecdote. Um, I'll come off share again. Um, a quick anecdote is that when I left that graveyard, with that giant puffball um, under my arm. 
I walked across the road to my car and there was a woman walking a dog. I get a few funny looks. This is what I was going to say, you know. I'm, I'm always in the roadside verges. I'm, I'm an urban forrier. I like to just make fungi accessible. That's a whole, There's next year's PowerPoint, how, how, to, how accessible fungi can be. You don't have to have the privilege of an ancient woodland on your doorstep. So I love urban spaces. But with that comes lots of, what are you doing? Beep, beep. Lots of honks and things like that. And you just have to be brave and, you know, cut it out. So I'm used to getting funny looks. And as I walked out of the graveyard, this woman was walking a dog and she purposely stopped and she just followed my eye like that and just watched me from the other side of the road. And no one's ever, you know, clearly stared at me that much. And there was nothing, you know, I wasn't crawling around at that point. I was just walking out of a graveyard. And only when I got in the car did I realise that it looked as though I was exiting the graveyard with a skull under my arm. Because that's what I think that's what the Latin might translate as, uh, like bald head. Um, so it looked like I was looked like I was carrying a skull, and I realised that afterwards, which is actually then hilarious. Um, I think. Um, so I'm going to take us back. So that's uh, that's one little anecdote. Let's take us back. Uh, it's a sharing screen. See what else I've got for you. Ooh, it's gone all the way down there again. All right, I'll take you down. So we've done some spore shooting. We've talked about the big one. Oh yeah, let's let's have a look at how to ID a mushroom. Go take you through this time. Whoo yeah, I'll wish you through this. No problem. Um, sorry, folks, it's because uh, slideshow from cut slide. All right, how to identify a mushroom? Um, I'll keep this brief, but there's some key notes to take. Uh, and essentially, when you find a fungus fruit body, you're going to want to inspect it from top to toe. And uh, on a course, for those who don't know, there are, I'll mention this. This is a bit of relearning. And I wonder if you can sing along at home. I made up a little rhyme for the four big mycorrhizal trees. It's the reason I find a lot of fungi in my area when my radar's turned up. is because really, I'm looking at that landscape on that subconscious level. I'm like, ah, big pile of butch near the garden centre. I'll just dip in there. Woo! Brittle gills, yes. And it's like those little victories in your day. And, and of course, the reason that my family hate me because we can't go anywhere in a straight line. There's lots of nipping off. For, oh, a big oak, what's under there? There might be something. So four big trees, birch, beech, pine and oak, birch, beech, pine and oak. Everybody, birch, beech, pine and oak, birch, beech, pine and oak. They're the four big ones. We've done that. So that can hopefully help you and maybe even bug your brain as you walk around the woods. But have those in mind. They have more fungi growing with them than any other. There are other mycorrhizal trees that have uh, uh, macro fungi growing with them, but they're the big four. Now then, someone asked me, can you think of a rhyme to help us learn how to identify a mushroom? That was last year. I never did anything about it, but I did, I did think of something for them. It was a course I was leading. And it goes like this. So if you're picturing from the top, working your way down, I'll, I'll, I'll let's see if I can remember it. Okay, here we go. First the cap and then the gills and then the stipe and then the base. Does this fella have a smeller when you hold it to your face? Okay, I think I started in the key too high there. It's too high for me. Um, forgive me, I wouldn't want usually be gender specific, but I couldn't do anything that rhymed with smeller, but to do smell and, and fella worked out for me there. Um, so yeah, make your way down it. Look at the cap. There are loads of different features going on with the cap, but look at the texture. It could be her suit. It could be slightly hairy. It could have little striations like little ridges along the cap margin. It might have an umbo in the middle. OK, there's lots to inspect about the cap. Look at the colorations. Darker at the edge or lighter at the edge. OK, lots of things. What kind of texture? Is it gloopy? Could have a gloopy texture. Uh, it could be sticky. Oh, I could name lots of things a cap could be, clearly. I'm not going to give you the full list. I'm just give you the rundown. Keep it in check, Ali. Then we're going to go underneath there and have a look at what's going on under there. There could be usually one of three things. It will either be gills, like we uh, we have looked at some of this before, which are those flaps of tissue, which is what you'd be most familiar with for anyone who's ever bought any shop-bought mushrooms from the, you know, like your, your classic portobellos. They are gilled fungi. Um, so you can have your gills. Or you could have a sponge, which are pores, and they're like tubes that essentially creates like a sponge. That's in the Belit family, uh, the Belit genus. Or you could even have, which is more, more uncommon, but they're still out there, hedgehog fungi, which have spines underneath, these tiny little soft prickles, which are beautiful to look at. 
Have a look at the gills especially. will tell you a lot about what that mushroom might be, how widely spaced they are, how they actually attach to the stipe. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on there in the gills, uh, the colour of them, because that'll tell you what colour the spores are. So loads of clues. And what this is, I'm very aware, I'm very aware it could sound really daunting, there's so much about fungi. But actually, that's what I love, because it's doable. For someone who's got a bit of a woo, a flitty brain, I've got so much to grab hold of that it all helps to make this puzzle so that uh, and put it all together, the pieces, so that it helps me understand what something is. And it's part of the fun. And, and then actually, there's usually, this is it, there's usually just enough to get you pretty close to whatever that mushroom is too, which makes it brilliant. I, I think that's just the absolute allure of them. Um, I'm showing you these two here, sorry, because when I met this one on the left, in the same graveyard as the skull, by the way, uh, another rare mushroom, because that was the first time I'd ever found a giant puffball. And this was the first time I'd found this. And I'm like, hang on, something's amiss. I know these orange with a white stem bleats that grow with birch and there was some birch nearby, but something was wrong. And it's that, hang on a minute, it hasn't got those little black dots, these scabers on the side. Is it because they've washed off? But I knew inherently the jizz of a mushroom, the look of it wasn't right. And so I did a bit of research. And as a result, um, well, I've done the ID rhyme. I looked at other trees around me and made sure I made note of this. This is going back a few years when I wasn't quite as experienced. I took pictures, look of the leaves. And these are all things you can do. If you're not sure what something is, check out the trees around you as well. That habitat, that substrate. We've spoke of this before in the last one. But I took pictures of the leaves as well. I didn't know this tree. And I bet you're all at home. There's loads of you going, I know that. It's quaking aspen. Yes. Is it populous tremula? Trem tremula? Um that beautiful shimmering one. Uh, and it, it turns out, and I've got all my special books out, I couldn't find the proper photo, but I've got a photo with loads of all my books really trying to pick what this might be. Turned out to be something quite rare. Uh, Lexinum albostipitatum, which is a great name. Um, and yes, grows out exactly with Aspen. So I was buzzing off that. So by putting together all the pieces we got there, back to the mushroom. I'm going to, um, because I haven't done videos, let's have a little, I'll just stop sharing a minute. Um, I'm going to hold up this because I haven't got a fruit, fruit body um, you've done the cat, we've gone underneath in this case this is like a belete in its stature this is supposed to be one of those porcini if anyone's heard of that and then you'd look at this stipe, this stem and you'd look what's going on for the belete family you get this reticulation like these these little, I mean this is just a painted one this is a model I made but um, you get these little painted network uh, uh, like reticulated network like, like fishnet stockings but on other stipes of regular mushrooms it might be um Little fibrillose bits going down. There might be cobwebs attached. There might it might be the shape of it because there can be clavate and club shaped. It can have a bulb at the bottom, um, and again it can be greasy. And as you work your way down, there's all these things reveal themselves. So getting to know fungi, getting to know certain genus families, um, can send you on your way because some are very typical. Some might have a ring on the Amanita family. Lots of the Amanita family, the deadliest family, they'll have a ring uh, left behind, a ring of tissue in the middle, an annulus, it's called. And then when you get to the bottom, it's important what's going on. Are they rooting? Are they born out of a little like sack at the bottom there? And that's typical of the Amanita family. So there's loads of little ID features as you go down. Do you know what I'm doing? Essentially, I'm saying inspect the whole thing carefully. Uh, that's that. That's what I could just wrote in bold, couldn't I? Because um, that's ultimately what I'm asking you to do. Look at the lot of it, everything, because all those little pieces will add up and paint a picture for you, hopefully, that you can get you to an ID. On which note, if you're asking for help, and I meant to make a little slide saying Mushroom Spotters UK are a wonderful uh, Facebook group. There are many others as well, but they're really accommodating and supportive of, of newcomers and, and experienced. People are still sharing. Now, you know, I will share on there for something I'm not sure of because there's a lot of wealth of knowledge and experts. Make sure you upload many pictures, you know, from above, below, the gill attachment, as much as you can get from something. OK, to try and upload and they will help you the best they can. If you just take a picture from the top of the cat from from about five feet away, you really you're going to really struggle to get a good answer from that one. OK, um, let's jump in back to the PowerPoint. See what we're up to. Uh, share screen again. I wish to. Oh, look where I am on my time. Goodness me. I was worried about not being able to do enough. Uh, and there's laws going down. OK, from current slide, I'll whiz through my last little bits. There it is. All right. Uh, the hoof fungus. Yes, I'm going to show you this. Uh, I'm going to hold it up and come off screen again. I I'm trying to dip into the screen and out again, so it's not just one thing you're looking at all evening. 
I know I would fall asleep if that was going on. This uh, is the hoof fungus, Formus formentarius. Uh, quite, I say quite common, but I don't see it tons, but it especially loves a beech tree. Um, and it's a hard woody bracket. You will find it in this state. It's not that it's just dried out on my shelf. It's a hard woody bracket. And it has had many uses over the centuries. And one of which is to make mushroom leather. It's a, it's a fibrous substance when it can be pounded out. And so it's a great um, alternative to um, to traditional animal leather. So you can make mushroom leather from it. It's also known as the tinder bracket because it will carry a spark. You can use the, because of this fibrous quality about it, you could throw a spark in and, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, people would carry sparks from uh, to be able to um, light fires in new destinations. On which note, um, Otzi, the caveman, there was a caveman found in the 90s and it's a 5,000 year old caveman and he had two pieces, incredible, he was he was in really good, um, he was really good nick. That's not a word you use for a caveman body, is it? He was in really good nick. But he was. And he even had remnants of, I think it's like leather pouches. And in two of his little leather pouches, he had two fungi with him. So even then, the knowledge was there, the land, of course. One was the birch pipor. We, the scientists think he was probably making some kind of a potion concoction for an intestinal worm. And one was this, a little piece of the tinder hoof bracket, um, also known as horse's hoof. And you can see why. Because it would have carried a spark for him, presumably, to be able to go and set up camp in his next spot. Um, just have a little look. I'll uh, I'll just show you that nice and close up. So there it is. It's a really cool thing. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a smashing one. In fact, even over over just over a hundred years ago, there was still an industry, a little cottage industry, I think, in France, where they would make little tinder boxes. So they'd pound these. It was an actual little cottage industry. They'd pound up the fibers, put them into a little tin, and you could buy your little fire, your your little uh, kindling tin, your tinder tin, and that was that. So it's a cool fungus that's um. Yeah, done many things over the years, and uh, it's a beautiful thing to find in the woods. You can get trees just laid up with them, all these shells, all these shells. All right, back to the screen, and we'll better get going towards the end here, then we could get some time for some questions. There he is, close up. Wow, what a find. All right. Oh, look, I circled him. Just in, case, just in case you didn't know which one the caveman was. <laughs> I put, put a red circle around him. That's funny. Just in case you weren't sure. All right. Mistaken identity. Quick story. This is a quick anecdote. I spotted this on a foray a couple of years ago in a woodland near me. I was leading a guided walk and over a fence and down near a stream in the long grass, I spotted this. And my heart did a bit of a flutter. I'm like, whoa, hang on a minute. Surely not. The red cage fungus. Um, so it's from the stinkhorn family, so it stinks. But there's this red cage fungus. I'm like, surely not. And I don't think it's ever been found this far north. It's usually got a bit of a southern slant. I'm like, oh, I've got it. I've got it. It won't be. And I knew it wasn't in my heart. Something just wasn't quite right. But I had to investigate. So I jumped over the fence down to the stream and picked it. Uh, oh, look, I've circled it again in case you weren't sure. There we go. And here I am holding up a phone to tell people. I Googled it to show people why I thought what it was. It turned out it was just a dog's ball. And you can see it in my hand there. In fact, the next slide will show it even clearer. Just look at that. Look at that. Who's having a who's having a laugh here? Is it the ball makers who are just happen to be massive fungi fans? Or as as I just don't know where this comes from. Irregular sized holes with that framework when you looked at it online. I mean that's outrageous, isn't it? So that's the red red cage stink home. There it is. It made it onto the uh, table of goodies. Got an ethereal glow. That's accidental that. Uh and there you are, you can see it. There it is. Uh Clathrus Archer Eye. Um Oh, no, it, it's, is it Aruba, this one? I think Archer has the, uh, yeah, Archer has that octopus one. Um, there it is, in, making this incredible structure. Um, so, yeah, that was just a little a little fun one because we'll all be caught out by litter. If you haven't already, then you've not looked for fungi enough. You'll be caught out by all sorts of bits of litter and leaves. Take the litter with you. I'm sure you do. Um, but guess what? I was at a mushroom festival this weekend. And it was this lovely end to the evening. It was a really sensible space, you know, uh, and a man, ran, but the point being a man ran up to me in a cape in the dark around a campfire. And it wasn't that kind of mushroom festival that, you know, it wasn't those kinds of things going on. It was a beautiful educational space with a cape, with a Tupperware. He said, Ali, do you want to look inside my tub in my Tupperware? And obviously being mushrooms, everyone was mushroom. I'm like, yeah, let's see. And it was this, and he brought a red cage stick card in a Tupperware um, with a couple of eggs. And actually, 
I've now got, there I am, I've actually got the egg planted here and it's almost there. It's almost there because stink on eggs you can actually take out of their environment once they're at a certain stage and they have enough, I guess, energy that they can erupt, uh, even taken out of their environment. So I usually sit them in a bit of soil and it's not that they regrow, there's no root structure, but there's enough energy that they will burst out. Um, and so I've got a little red cage stink on sitting there in the bedroom right now, which is cool. On which note, as I said, stink on eggs, you can plant them every year. I, I try and do a little race online just for fun. We do a little naming ceremony. We name them. This was Clive versus uh, Stinky Muck Stink Face. Uh, and every day we monitor to see who's going to win. And it was Clive that came up uh, 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 first last time. It's been a couple of years, actually. Um, but yeah, that's always fun. Um, so yeah, you can plant. In fact, I've got one here. And again, so close to uh, go. It's really, really close. I've got a stink on egg. It's absolutely bulging. In the next 24, 48 hours, I reckon that'll be up. It'll be up in one day and gone again the next night. Uh, it's a very quick turnaround for a stink horn. I think it's maybe one of the fastest growing fungi. All right. Um, I think we need to uh, maybe knock it on the head and go to this. I will just tell you this. No, will I? Will I? Oh, song. I tell you what, let's come back to those. Let's honour the fact we're supposed to keep this in a timeline because I think we're up to time here, aren't we? Yes, definitely. That's I do. I am aware that I speak quite fast, so I do apologise if I if I just rattle on. But especially when my energy levels are up here, my adrenaline's going because I'm talking about stinky cage fungi. I get going, so I apologise for being speedy. At the end of the questions, I will come back to these slides and tell you about these little bits. And if you really want, I'll sing a song to finish. All right. Uh, oh, there's uh, yeah, I had some bonus stuff ready just in case we were short of time. Uh, uh, in case we had lots of time left, we don't clearly. Here's a couple of things I'll leave on there. I will stop sharing, and at this point, I'll open up. Rebecca, if you want to, are you happy to field the questions? I can look in the chat, or you can. Yeah, I've, I've had a look in the chat. We've had one question in the chat. Um, people, feel free to um, write more questions in the chat, or at this point, we could just do raise your hand, and we'll just go through them that way. I like that. I like it because it's a moment, isn't it? You get it's to speak. Moment. We've yeah. got voices. Let's, I like let's that. Let's do that. Um, so the, the the only question that was in the chat was. Do all fungi have the same growth cycle? I've been to the usual place this year and many of the fruit bodies are no longer there and instead there's lots of new species. Um, many fungi can be transient. They can be around one year and then just a bit more over there, depending on what their relationship with their substrate is. So the mycorrhizal, certain fungi will be reliably there. They'll have better years than other years. I feel like that's what people do who have allotments and they say, oh, my broccoli's done well this year, but thingy hasn't over there. I feel like people never have a brilliant year of everything. Some years just because of conditions. That's essentially it. Conditions will, will there's lots of reasons, but conditions can be one. So right now I couldn't find a single mushroom fruit body on the way home. And that's quite sad for this time of year. It should be popping. But we've just had this incredibly, you know, unkind and, uh, ultimately, it's it's not right, is it, to have had two two weeks of blazing hot thirty degree sun? So all all the wrong way around. We had an early season, in fact, in July, it popped everywhere across the country like a real season. So everything's a bit skew if, as we know, because of climate breakdown. Um, but some some fungi will fruit reliably. It's just maybe that you're not there at the right time. So whenever you see a space, if it feels right, don't write it off because there's nothing there. Visit that space again if it's in the vicinity. Keep looking because if there's the right trees and everything about it feels right, there's a good chance something will grow there at some time. It just might be that you're not there at the right time. In terms of the species you're on about, it could just be that, again, they might have a week a year and something else comes through. There's something called the Golden Guild Belit. It's the only Belit that has gills. I found it once. I see it online posted, not even once a year. So, and, and it might be another 10 years before it pops again. There are certain fungi that just hardly ever come out, show themselves, and poof, you might not see them again, 5, 10, 15 years. Um, whereas some reliably fruit all the time and have a long cycle as well. So there's there's various reasons, but never give up on a space because once a mycorrhizal mushroom has been there, it's very likely at some point it will grow again because of course that fungus is living on underground. If, if the habitat doesn't get um, impeded or, or um, uh, you know, damaged in any way, because that's the greatest threat we've got to fungi is habitat loss. If that habitat stays the same, then we should be OK, depending on weather conditions. I hope that gives you some answer. Sounds great. Um, there was a quick request for you to um, write a children's book. 
um, <laughs> from Dylan, age 10. <laughs> now, now, I do, now I've got, I've got a book. Uh, that's a nice thought. Thanks, Dylan. What a nice thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I might look into that. It does, it does tie at the back of my mind. I think I would be quite well placed to have a go at that. Um, yeah, thanks. So, yeah. Dylan, at some point, put in the chat, what do you want it to be? Do you want it to be uh, an educational one with nice pictures, you know, whatever? Or do you want it to be some kind of a story with characters? Let me know in the chat what you think would work best. Any other youngsters out there who'd like to a particular book doing, let me know. And then uh, I can maybe pursue that. I think somewhere on the line, I will be addressing that. I have a, I have a degree in, in art. I should be able to do something along those lines. I mean, writing might be rubbish. Okay. Next question, if anyone's got one, if they'd like to unmute themselves and go for it. Oh, we've got hands up, haven't we? I don't know if that's a, a wave. Diana, is that a wave? Or are you just, are you, are you putting your hand up? That's a hand being raised. Like okay, Diana, do you want to ask your question? Um, yeah, I was recently foraging mushrooms with my mom back home in Latvia, which where that is like a national sport for us. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, there was a mushroom that I don't know, it looked like a bolette type, but it had this pink spongy undercap. So I've never seen that before. And our bolettes, they're quite clear. We know them as our Bible sort of, right? Um, mm. And my mom said it's a parasitic one, not parasitic, but invasive. So it's not a local, local one. It's come in from somewhere, right? And there's supposed to be this whole thing now about it. So I wanted to hear your thoughts about that when new species come in. I know it's a really difficult topic when it comes to plants and invasive or whatever, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, yeah. obviously, you know, again, this climate breakdown is ch changing things. So essentially, I don't know what my feelings are because obviously if something feels unnatural, that's never okay, is it? Um, but if fungi spread and they'll find their way. I mentioned a fungus last year that only exists in New Zealand and England because it came over, they think, with the New Zealand rowing team in back in the 1970s. And it, and it made it here, but it's not got to anywhere else in Europe. So these these little things going on. And it's whether, I suppose, it, whether it's detrimental. You know, all things have a way of working their way out. So I try and just make peace with it because I feel like I'm just going around a little bit angry all the time. And life's very short. So I'm trying to just, you know, be at peace with whatever presents itself to me. Tread lightly be kind, do those things. So I try not to get myself too wound up about any any kind of huge changes unless it was obviously very clearly detrimental. Um, but there are certainly southern species that are slowly climbing their way up the country. Um, there's, uh, there's the pink, the orange ping, pat, uh, ping pong bat. Uh, it's this tiny little weird, a bit like the spongy one that you mentioned, but these little flaps, these little oyster mushrooms that are full of holes and bright orange. And that's right there on the coast and it's heading northwards now. Every year they find it a little bit further north because as, of course, warmer climates, it's coming up out of Europe. So a few things. So I've got mixed feelings, really. Like I say, I just try and keep everything at arm's length because, yeah, like I said, life feels too short and I'm just going to try and embrace it on whatever level it is. And if there was something active I could do, I would do it. But it feels like nature has this bigger picture and it kind of has its way of finding working its way out it's more about us humans our impact direct impact i think on a habitat that i think i can make a difference so a bit wacky. and if you wanted an idea on your mushroom if i can't think what it is but a pink bolete makes me think of calciporus um which is quite a rare a rare one but it might not be in latvia i don't know like you said you haven't really come across it before um i can't think what it's called it's this beautiful pink bolete basically quite rare here Okay, mm. I hope that answers thank a little you. bit, Diane. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Anybody else? Kimberly's got a hand up. Kimberly, did you want to unmute yourself? Hi, uh, yeah, it's Kim. Uh, actually, it's Robin, um, um, I'm Kimberly's partner. Um, Hi, Robin. So I just had a, a quick question. You were talking about pa um, parasitic fungi, um, sort of like quite early on in the talk. Um I've, I've spoken to people about fungi in, in the past and how parasitic fungi might might work. And is parasitic really the best way to describe them? Mm. Um, is it not that they are just generally decomposers that might be uh, attaching themselves to trees, for example, that might actually already be on their way out anyway? Or is it that they are killing the trees? Because that's really a bit of a... That... Sorry, Robin, I interrupted you. Uh, no, no, sorry. It just seems a bit of a 
point of disagreement whether it's the, the the fungus is there because the tree is dying or it's what's killing the tree right well i'll, I'll tell you two parts to this for me first science as a as i made it was my disclaimer at the beginning if you deep dive me on this stuff i'm not brilliant i'll be really honest about that my my skill set lies in just trying to understand and just keep finding new bits to just kind of get and, and, and engage people with and engage myself with so my science deep dive is terrible however my understanding of this would be that a parasite it's it's essentially what is the definition of parasite isn't it i think so a parasite is if it's not mutualistic if it's just at the detriment of whatever it is so then of whatever the host substrate becomes so that that's the question is it detrimental it might be detrimental to the host but is it part of nature's big plan which is maybe if i'm understanding you right is it not better to be considering that it's all part of the parcel and it's getting a bad rap by being called a parasite i'm not sure on what level so you can have because parasites can be like you say, the heartwood of an oak tree uh, is dead already. And actually a parasite getting in there, it's already for a parasite, as we call it, to be able to um, um, start to make a difference and to actually attach to the tree and then begin to do its thing. It is already weakened in some way, that tree. And actually, like you say, it's maybe part of a cycle because it's it's it would be detrimental to not rot away that heartwood. It's well known that actually that's really, really crucial, especially in some of our ancient trees, to take away all that weight out of the center of the trees in order that actually it can flex a little bit more in the wind or else we'd have these huge monsters over and dead. So it gives them incredible longevity because we've got specific fungi designed to do that job. Now, the parasites can go in and start to kill the 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 essence of the tree for want of a better word and then they may become saprotrophs they may become recyclers you can have weak to mild parasites to, to strong ones and very invasive like the honey fungus um and and then yeah they become a saprotroph and do the job that needs doing on that tree so i guess it's at what detriment it is i would argue that the caterpillar i don't think he'd be too happy it probably is just purely detrimental to him i don't think there's any mutualistic element to it um it's just detrimental to that insect but big but beneficial to the whole eco infrastructure of fungi and spores and eating and and the likes so a, a, a bit of a broad answer sorry because i don't have a, a clear definition other other mycologists will be able to answer you better i'm sorry that i can't but i hope that gives a kind of a picture uh, of of what i think about a parasite is there's something called the parasitic elite not a common find but we've just seen it this weekend and they're already talking about it parasites um an earth ball really really unusual substrate but people are saying maybe right. there's a bit of it's not that detrimental to the earth ball maybe actually they seem to co-survive all right and if it can still sporulate then again maybe there's this greater purpose this bigger picture that means that the two can coexist so that coexisting of things in nature and plant pathogens, you know, there's kind of this thing. There's a reason often for these things in in, in my limited understanding of it. I hope that gives you some idea, Robin. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. No worries. OK. Uh, I can't see everybody's hands, Rebecca. I don't know if you can, although there's a few hundred to look at. I don't, <laughs> I don't think anyone else has got their hand up. And we did have a really interesting question in the chat saying, my garden has no natural earth. The previous owners paved the lot. It's all containers and raised beds that I've built, including some small trees. Can you still get fungi networks in that environment too? I would argue yes. So you might not get mycorrhizal fruit bodies, some of these big mushrooms like the beliefs and the milk caps, the ones that are the associative with trees. Um, but there will be a fungi network within that soil. Um, I don't think there could not be. Over a matter of time, you know, obviously you might introduce a brand new compost that just haven't because I've just been talking to a compost expert at the weekend. It's not my forte, but he said something and I was quite interested. I could not listen. He was good at what he did because he was passionate. And he's just, you know, composts are dead if you just buy them in bags. But he's working really hard at the data and the impact of, of living compost and what it does. And I think that's what we're talking about here, that nature will find a way. There'll be spores landing constantly and it's essential to the to the growth of those things within your your potted tubs and even just fungi will start landing on the wood on the on, on, you know your wooden borders they'll start writing them down essentially they are old trees and a fungi's like i i come in and i'm going to be a saprotroph i'm going to recycle you so you might get jelly ears you might get jelly spot um 
jelly discs, all sorts of uh, coral spot, things start to break down and digest that wood. So there'll be fungal activity. Yes, is the short answer. Fungal activity. And you will get some mushrooms that are saprotrophs that just live in, in the dirt and things. Um, so, yeah, fungal activity, there will be. Fab, does anybody else have any questions? There was one last one in the chat that was, what was your favourite ever fun fungi find? My favourite ever fungi find? Probably changes all the time, that. <laughs> uh, my son found the golden gills when he was five. I didn't have a clue what it was. He didn't. And only when I, I, I spoke to my, my mentor and hero who taught me everything I know uh, called Jesper Landa. And he went, dude, that's a pretty special thing. And it was just sat in this little five-year-old's hand, this beautiful yellow gilled mushroom. And I recorded it. Obviously, a knee-jerk reaction might be like, ah, you've taken it and it's quite rare or whatever. Um, but there's so much learning and so much that comes from some, that, that process of taking, digesting. It went under the microscope. It got recorded. Um that's that's a really fun memory. I think maybe I'm not really the most um, uh, what's the word? Uh, not emotional, but uh, ultimately, it's a nice memory of my child when he was five, holding beautiful things, and we used to go out together. Now he's fourteen, and he couldn't care less. He is miles away from here right now, uh, and he can spot a blusher from twenty paces. He's amazing with fun guy, but he doesn't care anymore. So maybe it's me just doing that kind of uh, rose tinted glasses thing. But yeah, the golden gills is special because I've never seen it since, and I'm looking forward to meeting it on my terms with the knowledge I've got. Like I know what you are, so that'd be nice because I, I found it without knowing. So the next time that'd be good. I saw something pop up then uh, about people looking at me weird in the chat. Uh, how do I feel? Uh, can't quite see it. Any fungi grow underwater? Yes, they do, but it's not my speciality because I, I struggle just to get to work on in the morning looking at the grass verges. I'm definitely not going to start going un underwater to look to. Um, any identification books? If you look at the last one, I put some pictures up on, uh, on a screen, my final screen on the last talk I did. Go on YouTube and you see those there rather than me spiel them out again. Uh, oh, there's lots of questions in there. I'm not going to go into... Through the crack pavement, yes, very good. Um, yeah, I can't see the one. Someone said, "How do it, how does it make me feel?" Look, I get embarrassed like the best of them, especially if I've got a camera. Somehow that makes me feel a bit weirder if I'm filming myself. But as soon as I'm in the zone, I don't care what people are doing. I won't care if someone else was doing something by the side of the road. Just be like, oh. But as a, as a society, we find it like, what's that guy doing? Some people can really give you abuse. I was finding some truffles with a friend in Tesco car park. So that just shows how if you have your knowledge, it was Jesper teaching me, he said, here, there's an embankment of hornbeam. And if you see some squirrel dig holes, there's a chance there might be truffles because that's what they're digging for, not always acorns. And sure enough, with fingers in holes, and someone had shouted at him, get a life, you know, swore at him, so angry that some man would be on his hands and knees. And Jesper thought, I have got a life. I'm living my best life. I'm finding truffles in Tesco. So people have this strange aversion to just seeing you be unique or stand out and i think that's a beautiful quality personally that doesn't mean i don't get a bit self-conscious but it's like well what are you doing because i'm having a great time don't worry about what i'm doing i'm having a lovely time thanks <laughs> so that's how i feel about that um okay uh if there's oh sarah fox has got a hand up sarah do you want to mute yourself and say hi i have hello there really hello, good talk. thank you and props to the wild swimming shirt i'm enjoying your shirt <laughs> oh, do you know what? Yeah, it looks like I'm wearing my pajamas. I didn't mean to do that. I just quickly threw a shirt on, and it's uh, yeah, it's swimmers on there. That it wasn't meant to be a plug. All for the people. best clothes look slightly like pajamas, I think. Um, <laughs> so, so for the uninitiated, you have your lovely little pre song, which is wonderful. But like, I know there are places I go which are fungi rich. We're going to Scotland in November, and that's going to be beautiful in the pine forest. But around here, around Manchester, around the city. What are you looking for when you're looking for urban fungi? Is it specifically those trees that you told us about or are there other things that we want to look for? That would be my starting point all day long. Yeah, it's the trees. Because I'm looking for macro fungi, which mean, by that I mean large mushroom fruit bodies. And they're most likely to be growing in association with the trees. That's your best bet. And we're about to hit the zone. The rains are coming hard. In the next week and two, you should expect to see everything popping because of that heat, that baking heat. The mycorrhizae will just have been screaming to get, woof, get some fruit bodies because it needs to needs to make some some fruiting bodies and needs to create some spores so it because it's under stress it'll be a stress fruit so i'd imagine in these next few days you'll see the first of the early fruiters coming up but the trees are the thing that will mainly get you to those mushrooms and then other things come because then you might have something that's not with a tree but it's because of the moss that's on that side and whatnot so yeah it's it's roadside verges 
Bury Leisure Centre Car Park has some lovely things, Sarah. We're both in Bury. Um, uh, there's outside the solicitors, Bury, I won't say, there's a school in Bury and I know there's Porcini growing their lawn because of the big birch trees that made me walk over to the lawn. I dared start mooching around a high school uh, out of hours. That would look really wrong, even though there's Porcini through the, through, through the fence. But I don't do that. It really, I need to have a proper conversation, not loiter in schools. That's the worst thing I could do, isn't it? Um, so, yeah. Um, but if you look at the last one, I talk a little bit about, but basically you just start to get your radar on about what environments. And on a subconscious level, the more you do it, you realise that that looks like the right space. But ultimately the trees, birch, beech, pine and oak, if you start having a look under those, it's there you go, you see, the length of grass. Short mown, but not just, just being cut. So about a week's length, because just being cut, they won't be there. Too long and the mushrooms won't come out. So well-maintained communal parks, which is why parks and gardens and lawns can do really well in an urban environment. Um, yeah, so there you go. That, that, that's that's a quick tip, but it's it will be the trees that get me there every time. And then on a subconscious level, I might be looking in other little bits and pieces. But then big the big four, they'll get you stuff. I'll take you a walk around the, city cent the town centre one day, Sarah. <laughs> we'll have a great time looking at the slitters uh, front lawn in the town centre. Okay, and graveyards is a big one. Someone's mentioned that, you're right. Graveyards, a couple of people saying, sing the song. Do, 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 if there's no more questions, I'll do a question and I'll sing the song. I, if think, I, don't want to do. <laughs> I think we've finished on questions now. I think we'll leave it there. We've just, yeah, got up to our time. Just to let you know, there's so many comments saying, thank you so much. Gus says, best night they've had in ages. Um, loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward to many more. Can we have a two-hour session next year? So... <laughs> That's what you know what you need to do in advance. Somehow we need a communication of things you'd like me to do. I should be responding to you now instead of just spewing. Yeah. Maybe if, yeah. if there's some communication we can do where you put up some ideas and I'll try and zone in on a couple. And uh, and then that way I'm responding to what you'd like to know, rather than presuming I can tell you. Let's let's look at that maybe. Uh, thank you so much. I can see these popping up here. It's, it's some very nice compliments. My, I'm full of love. So thank you so much. It's uh, really an absolute honour. Um, really nice. Um, yeah. Lovely. Really, really. Thank, thank you, you for so having much. me. And if you do I, want to do the song. I'll Listen, I'll do the song. You can all just go home. If you want it, you don't. They, they, this is it. It's not enforced, is it? We've gone way I'm over the time. Who wants it? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just <laughs> I'll just sing it if you want to drop off. If yeah. I see just one little screen left and it's too long, I know that I know that, I know that everyone else has gone home. The other 220 of you went home. Right. I'll just try and turn this then. Let's give it a go. I didn't even... Now you'll see the room. Look at that. That's a boy's bedroom, isn't it? Look at that. Let's have a look. I just need to give myself enough space so I can get in it. Let's have a look here. Uh, oh, someone asked if I'm doing any walks this year. I'm afraid I don't do... I do a lot of walks, but I do... I try and get a spread of walks for other people and walks for myself. Um, and also some time for me and my family because I'm a terrible dad and an awful husband, bad brother, rubbish friend. During fungi season, I'm, I'm all of, I'm just wondering how embarrassing this is. <laughs> Real life, this people. It's just like behind the green curtain in the uh, in the Wizard of Oz, isn't it? Um, so yeah, my walk sold out. I didn't do many this year because I'm trying to get a nice life balance. An important thing because I could easily say yes to everything and run around. So I've not done many of my own, and they all sold out. I'm sorry, but this Saturday, if anyone's in the Midlands, I'm in Nottingham. I'm in. Uh, I tell you where I am. Sherwood Pines, and there are tickets left still. And it's quite a big, and they're, they're, it's a nice six hours, it's a full day of it. It's from like 10 to, I'm sorry if I'm advertising, but I'm just pointing it out. Uh, I'm there from something like 10 till four. So we do an hour in the classroom to begin with, then we'll go out and, and look around the pines, and it's beautiful. So I'm there on Saturday, and there are tickets left. So there you go. Um, all I need to do now is find my capo, because if you ain't got a capo, you're not getting it. There we go. Right. I'll finish with this. <laughs> That's funny um, for anyone that's still around. Thanks for staying. That's nice of you. I hope it's not a letdown. There's a good, there's a 40% chance you'll be like, oh, should have gone and had my tea. Um, this is a song about cordyceps, which is that one, the parasite, sorry, Robin, uh, that attacks that um, the, the the pupa of, of uh, moth caterpillars, uh, moth pupa, uh, butterflies, and some beetles, drives it underground, like the zombie fungus, they say, takes over it. Uh, completely consumes it and then bursts out its head through the soil and comes out of the ground like this little orange beacon. So this is called Itty Bitty Beacon of Death. And it's the world premiere on the internet. Okay. 
Can you hear me all right? Can you hear it okay? Is, is it a thumbs up? No. Yeah. Oh. No, what do I need to be? Do I need to be closer for the guitar? Can you hear that? Yes, we can hear. You can't have seen some thumbs down from some people saying they can't hear it. I wonder why not. Uh, oh. Oh. Is everyone, can, can, just for those who are around then, because I'm not going to play if you can't hear it, that'd be weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, let's have a look at the gallery, just so I can get a bit of a... Just thumbs up if you can, then. Uh, oh, I might have to yeah. sit really close. You might have to get the sat down quiet version then, might you? I wonder why it won't carry. I wonder why that is. I don't know. Mm. All right, listen, a quick shout out, because I just saw two very familiar faces there then, of rock linen. Rocklin and his mum Dawn. We've got another amazing young mycologist, and I mean, I love really really in That's so in the room. Hey, Rocklin and Dawn. He's incredible. I mean, really, the names you heard that name here, Rocklin. He is an amazing mycologist <laughs> and very kind to me. Can we hear that? Okay. Yeah, sounds good. We've got some old OKs. I'm sorry that it's maybe it's this, isn't it? Maybe it's my computer. I tell you what, let's bring that right up. Right up, because that's not the camera. All right, I'm just going to sing it now. Just have to treat it like a poem if you can hear me voice. <laughs> you might try your best to give me the slip. A good idea so I don't get a grip. Because if I get a hold, frightening things will unfold. Because I'm an itty bitty beacon of them. The chances are I'll find you, I'll win. You'll either chew me up or I'll land on your skin. Either way, I make it my business, you die. Because I'm an itty bitty beacon of them. I like it when you wriggle around, even more so when you head on the ground. I'll have the upper hand to get the faster plan. Because I'm an itty bitty beacon of them. Here we go. Yeah, you might think I won't, but I think I might. Cause I was born to be a parasite. It gives me such a big thrill when I go in for the kill. Cause I'm an itty bitty beacon of death. But wait, I worry that I might be found. Cause I have uses when I'm out of the ground. Like the time I helped those Chinese athletes over the line. In a new world record time away, I worry when I wave around in case a hand pulls me from the ground and steeps me in some tea to increase lung capacity and all round virility. Just make sure that you're in no sense of doubt that I'll consume you from the inside to out. But I'll wait till you're dead before I burst out your head. Because I'm an idiot, bitty beacon of death. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> All right. <laughs> See, I told you you wish you'd gone for your tea. All right. <laughs> That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing that talk for us tonight, Ali. It's been incredible, fascinating, everything that everyone's saying in the comments. That's really, really kind yeah. of you all. Thank you so much. It, it fills me. It really does. It fills me. Um, so lovely stuff. Uh, I did put my email out there. Don't all bombard me. Better if you get in touch through Instagram, the fungi guy. But email Ali at the fungi guy .com if you're desperate to know something and I'll try and get back to you. It's a busy period, but I'll always try. Okay. Fab. Thank Brilliant. you so much. Thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah, yeah. What a, what a mustache that is! That's superb, Brunton. There, well, that's a real fantastic effort. Well done, sir. Okay, everyone. Okay. See you later. See you you later. Watch, Take you care. Everyone. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Rockland and Evan and Sarah. People that I can see, I know.